Welcome everyone to the uh, Department of Medicine's Grand Rounds for today. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Mahana, one of our former residents and fellows, join us today. Uh, Dr. Mahana is a board-certified interventional cardiologist and vascular specialist. He is currently a clinical assistant professor of cardiology uh, in the Cardio Cardiovascular Fellowship Training Program Director at the Lebanese University Medical Center. Um, soon after his graduation from the American University of Beirut Medical School in 2009, Dr. Mahana moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where he completed a research fellowship in invasive imaging at the Cardiovascular Imaging Core Lab of the Case Western Reserve University. Uh, following that, he joined us for residency in internal medicine, followed by a fellowship in cardiology. He then joined Brown University for his interventional cardiology fellowship before pursuing a vascular medicine and intervention fellowship at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Uh, he's, he's a he is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, Cardiology, and Interventional Cardiology. He is also a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions. He has won numerous awards and distinctions, including the Resident and Fellow Research Award of the Case Western Reserve uh, Department of Medicine for his work in three-dimensional atherosclerotic plaque assessment. He also won the Fellow of the Year Award uh, at the University Hospitals Case Medical Center and Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center. Uh, he's offered a, authored over 25 peer-reviewed art articles, five book chapters, and is a reviewer for several scientific journals. His research focuses uh, on the development of modern percutaneous coronary interventional techniques, uh, most notably the use of intravascular imaging and specifically optical coherence tomography for the diagnosis and treatment of coronary and vascular disease. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Emil Mahana today to talk to, talk to us about cardiac manifestations of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's really, truly a pleasure to be back remotely to, to, to Cleveland. And as you mentioned, I'm an interventional cardiologist. So uh, it's interesting what maybe what gets you to, to, to talk about COVID as an interventional cardiologist who does OCT, who spends most of his time in the core lab uh, back in the days in Cleveland. But as I was talking earlier, moving to Beirut changes a bit how, 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 how medicine is practiced. And we'll try, uh, we'll try first to talk a bit, you know, this is a medis medical grand round and, and I have people who taught me and their expertise will definitely exceed my expertise in COVID. But we'll try to give you a bit of, of a glimpse how uh, we've been doing things from one side and what we know mostly. But before that, for the people who, who again, you, this was a long introduction, but I was also known in my residency as being a brochure and the website model. So uh, this was one of them. And also <laughs> at the same time, I was member of the Movember Movement Edition 1.0. This is Dr. Keith Armitage in his old days. This, this is the Movember Movement who we started. This was version 1.0. And last but not least, I was actually shocked to discover that I am also a public figure in the recruitment presentation when I had one of my students this year telling me, hey, Dr. Mahana, we saw you on the intern recruitment. So <laughs> this was the good old days of Cleveland. So uh, once again, I'm very thankful to be here. But today we'll, be, we'll try to, 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 to tackle a bit few things and mostly talk about how can COVID-19 affect the heart. We'll talk a bit about special consideration for routine cardiac testing being on the internal medicine side. We are ordering sometimes echoes, TEs, when to do it, when not to do it. Briefly, we'll mention about that. We'll talk about cardiac screening of professional athletes and their manifestation basically of the disease in professional athletes. And, and, and I'll also mention why, why I am talking about that. And that's, you know, it might, might sound a bit weird for, 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 for a cardiologist and interventionist to talk about this. And finally, a small study we're doing, 80 patients we're doing currently in our center. What's the, the biggest challenge, I think, in this grand round was, when, was the amount of data you get. When, when I just was doing a quick review here, when I was asked by Dr. Armitage to give this grand round on October 15th, if you just Google, uh, if you just put on PubMed cardiac manifestations of COVID-19, we had 303 results. And just yesterday night, doing the same exercise or just changing filtering, basically, we got 485 results. And this tells you that COVID-19 probably is, and anyway, it was already mentioned, that it gives you the, the biggest amount of data was generated. And this is a dual-edged sword because some of the data is good and some not as good. 
But let's start with the first topic. How can COVID-19 affect the heart? Well, the heart, as we like to always talk about it and do the analogy, is the pump. And COVID can affect anything in the pump. The pump, to work properly, has to have a structure, meaning a muscle, valves. It has to have electricity going into it. And absolutely, you have to have some plumbing. These are your coronary arteries. So COVID can be nasty to all of these, can cause injury on the myocardium, can cause arrhythmias, whether COVID or even its, its, uh, its therapies sometimes. It can lead to cardiomyopathies, myocarditis, and finally, some acute coronary syndrome. And we'll be talking about these, as I mentioned, in more details. But first, let's start with, again, this is, I'm pretty sure by now you've had so many grand rounds on COVID and with, with, with experts talking about it, what we knew, and this is really the most uh, very trivial, that it, you know, COVID-19 is caused by this novel beta coronavirus officially named, uh, named SARS-CoV-2. And we know that the host receptor through which that virus uh, enters the cell is the NACE2. And this is one of the reasons that, you know, that why we, can, we have an effect on the heart, because we do have the uh, ACE2 expressed highly in human heart, vessels, and gastrointestinal tract. I'm pretty sure, as I said, by now you've had a lot of these grand rounds and talks and, 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 and um, uh, 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 nude conferences uh, about, about every single manifestation. And literally, we had every system... In, can be affected by COVID. And that's what actually we've been doing in our institution. We had a series of COVID by a neurologist, COVID by a cardiologist, COVID by a gastroenterologist. So briefly, a quick refresher about the stages of the disease. And the disease, as you know, progresses from stage one, an early infection to the pulmonary phase, to the stage three, hyper, the hyper uh, inflammation. And really, uh, this is, we, we knew from the initial days when, when COVID started that people with or patients with cardiovascular risk factor and established cardiovascular disease are a vulnerable population when they suffer from COVID. And the goal was to, again, to try to understand one, why does that happen and how does it happen? Let's talk so many graphs. I will keep it simple. Let's look at the left uh, lower corner here. When trying to basically understand the mechanism of, of the cardiac injury. Well, it's not well 100% established. We know that there is increased cardiac stress because of the respiratory failure and hypoxemia. There is direct myocardial infection by the, by the virus. There is an indirect injury from the systemic inflammatory response. And sometimes the three can happen together. This basically picture or this big graph published in, in Jack last year puts it all in one picture and, and makes it easier. But as you know, we're not talking usually, and I'll be mentioning this later on, but usually the mild forms of COVID have usually little effect on the heart, or at least that's what we knew. And it's the more severe the disease is, the more effects we have on the heart. And it's due to the combination of things I mentioned. Obviously, hypoxic patient, hypotensive patient, you remember from, from the CCU days when you have Dr. Joseph and Dr. Ortiz or Dr. Mohan specifically talking about this oxygen supply and demand. And when we have this mismatch, you can, this can lead to the myocardial injury. And can you imagine adding that to pre-existing cardiovascular disease? Now, this is one mechanism. The virus itself can affect and can enter the cardiomyocyte and can cause toxicity. That's another thing that, that, can, that can happen. You've, I'm pretty sure you're, you, we're all familiar and in our protocols about the anticoagulation being used, several protocols, 0.5 or 0.6 milligram per kilogram of Lovenox BID, some go for NOAC, some started by doing aspirin. And while the data is not super solid, we know for sure that there is somehow a hypercoagulable state there and, and it, 
a prevalent high prevalence of thrombus in in disease in this disease process especially as i said in the advanced stages of covid and all this can affect the heart we can always have a simple epicardial plaque rupture a, a heart irregular STEMI, or you can have the thrombotic STEMI that, that, or, or the thrombotic ACS, and we'll be talking about these. So while this picture, we spent some time on this picture, it puts everything in, in, in perspective. The heart, that pump, can be hit on multiple fronts. The nutrients or the oxygenation, the hypoxia can hit it, the virus can hit it, the thrombus can happen there, and you can always have the plaque rupture process, which is how, which was which is basically the most common uh, uh, pathophysiologic mechanism of, uh, of ACS. So let's talk about each, each one of these. The first, we'll start about the biomarkers. And in our protocol, and I'm pretty sure like you can have 200 protocols in, in every institution because everyone, at least in the US, you go by guidelines. When you work in Lebanon, each, each physician has basic, uh, becomes a professor when it comes to COVID. And, but some things are facts and, some, and it's always good to have objective metrics when you're talking about injury. And we knew that cardiomyocyte injury can be quantified with troponin. So troponin is a very useful marker in, in, in assessing uh, any myocardial effect of COVID. The second thing, the anti-pro BNP, because the hemodynamic stress can, can, be, can be quantified by that marker. And we have data to say that the level of these markers correlate with the disease severity and mortality. And these two biomarkers should be interpreted as quantitative variables. So it's not just, I believe, you know, troponin for a cardiology fellow or a cardiologist used to be the nightmare, right? Every, every time someone sneezes in the hospital, the high sensitivity troponin is positive. We used to get our, our consult. But there are two disease processes. I believe troponin and BNP can be useful outside of you know, the typical heart failure. PEs, pulmonary embolus, these big PEs to try to understand uh, you know, what's massive, what's, sub, what's submassive. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you do, you do some of that work in the spurt or the pulmonary embolus response team. But in COVID, it also has its own importance because that quantification can, can, can be very important uh, in, in telling us how severe the disease. And as I said, looking at this graph here, you can see that the higher the high sensitivity troponin, the, the higher the disease severity. And of course, I didn't talk about the shock by itself. So, the second, so that's, that's, that's one basically injury we want to talk about. The second thing I was talking about how the heart can be affected by COVID is basically the electricity of the heart can go wrong. Initially in the early days, you know, most of the data was coming obviously from China. And initially one of uh, uh, Zhu and his colleagues described that in, in, in 137 patients admitted for COVID-19, arrhythmias were present in 7%. And then in another cohort, especially in ICU uh, uh, patient cohort, arrhythmias was, were much more prevalent. It'd be interesting to know like, you, the experience also at, in, in, at, at university hospitals at the end or at the VA. And the initial thing to do was every time you have a COVID patient entering, you just get an EKG. Uh, especially in the early days of hydroxychloroquine. You know, this hype of hydroxychloroquine was all over. And, and one of the problems of hydroxychloroquine was the QT prolongation and all its, its problems. So while the cardiac, the early stages we recognized or we, we read about, I want to say, arrhythmias being more prevalent in patients getting admitted and even more prevalent. In, in the ICU setting, there was also no clear mechanism. Later on, we started having more reports about this prevalence of, of, of arrhythmia. This was published, again, most of the study we're, we're showing today are 2020 and 2021. 
that's that's as I mentioned, like hundreds of studies popping right and left. But this was a small study, 700 patients with COVID-19. It's done in the USA and by Ishigami and and and, and colleagues. And in these eight percent of patients, uh, this gives you a smaller basically number of patients having arrhythmias. And this eight percent, you can see you, they vary from atrial fibrillation significant bread arrhythmias, non-sustained VTs, and cardiac arrest. So you'll ask me, okay, we need stronger, bigger data. Okay, you have the Chinese first telling us it can be up to 44%. A small study telling us it is 700 patients. Then there was this survey just published a few weeks ago. It's a worldwide survey of COVID-19 associated arrhythmias. And here, 12 countries participated across four continents, and I'll show the map after it. And it was clear that most of the people who had the arrhythmias, they were, did not have history of arrhythmia. The second thing that the arrhythmias that happen most commonly are atrial arrhythmias. And it makes somehow sense. We, we always knew from just being in the medical ICU that we, a lot of these ATACs and the polymorphic you know, atrial, uh, 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 the math basically, tachycardias can, can happen with, with lung involvement. And here we were seeing them. And here with the biggest report so far on the arrhythmias happening with COVID-19, we see that the majority are atrial arrhythmias. We can have ventricular arrhythmias. The incidence can be different between, the, between countries. And, and obviously, uh, among the patients who developed arrhythmias, 43% were mechanically ventilated. So once again, more advanced disease, more arrhythmias, worse outcomes. And one last thing that was mentioned, I found it interesting in this survey that was just published, as I said, in, in circulation uh, EP, uh, is that most of institutions have a drastic decrease in EP procedures because most of these procedures are elective, as we all know, AFib ablations, you know, AVRT, AVNRT. So that's basically where who participated in the survey. When I said four continents, it 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 goes literally uh, from uh, from California to Tokyo, and probably one of the very few places. This is a, probably a world peace type of like a map. We have Tehran and the USA uh, and the New York, Washington DC in one map. But what we learned from it again is that cardiac arrhythmias are common, and with patients that are hospitalized and sick, especially when they become ventricular arrhythmias, they can be really nasty. Now I don't want to dwell too much on the QT story because especially with the we, we have been using and we are still using some medications that can mess with the QT. That's why with among the cardiac manifestations are arrhythmias, get an EKG when, you, you, when, when the patient gets admitted and take a good history whenever it's possible. Make sure the electrolytes are, are as good as possible and ultimately... Uh, Again, follow closely if you are using a medication that can prolong the QT by repeating the EKG and reassessing the risk and benefit of uh, these medications. Because again, that patient that is sick in an ICU with COVID has all predisposing factors for going to a nasty, deadly, lethal arrhythmia. And just by doing our part, checking an EKG, making sure the electrolytes are all good, we can sometimes correct for that risk. The third thing I will talk about in that pump, remember my, my, my talk is about the cardiac manifestations of COVID and the biggest problem in cardiology today, all things combined, is heart failure, right? And cardiomyopathy. Initially, again, in the early days of COVID, the same reports from the I mean, Chinese groups reporting, initially it was reported that up to 23% of patients with COVID-19 presentation to the hospital had some form of heart failure. Now, let's, I mean, later on we discovered again that this is maybe an overestimation. This is maybe an overestimation when they had spread of the disease, but things again 
go in the same direction. Meaning patients who are sicker are more, more susceptible to having a bad heart failure. And well, the mechanism is the same. I mentioned, you know, the mechanism of heart failure in COVID patients is, the sim is similar to the mechanism I, I showed uh, earlier uh, in, in my first slides, you know, ischemia, injury, all these combined, ARDS, stress-induced also. We didn't talk too much about it, the Takatsubo uh, that can, can, can be uh, basically caused by that. And when, uh, when, when, when we see basically, even in patients that are hospitalized, the one that did not survive have, have had much higher prevalence in, of heart failure up to 50%. Now, we, we, when we think of heart failure and cardiomyopathy, our mind straight takes, uh, takes us to the left-sided heart failure, but we should know that the right-sided failure and an associated pulmonary hypertension can also happen uh, in, in, in these instances. Now, the mechanisms, I mentioned them briefly. Again, a quick refresher because that's, you know, this, this repetition is important. Most of the reports are, when we're talking about cardiac manifestations of COVID, we're talking about the virus attacking the, uh, um, basically impairing the heart by direct effect. You can talk, we're talking about the pro-inflammatory cytokines that a lot of these we're, we're quantifying into Lucan 6 specifically in our protocol in our hospital that can cause basically uh, this, this pro-inflammatory cytokine storm causing necrosis and death of myocardium. There is the endothelial injury, and this is a topic of interest in our center when I mentioned finally the uh, the small study we're doing that can cause this microthrombosis which can damage the endocardium and finally this severe hypoxia all these mechanisms you see are repeating themselves but they're hitting badly the pump hitting the muscle hitting causing arrhythmias and and ultimately we'll talk about more about ACS now myocarditis a, a uh, has been described, suspected, you know, no clear recommendation about how to treat myocarditis. I did not mention it. You probably read it in my previous slide, but we treat heart failure in COVID like we treat heart failure without COVID. We try basically to, if the patient in, in shock, to keep them alive first and foremost, and to try to help with, with the reason they are, they are really, they went into heart failure when we know it, especially if it's hypoxia, by escalating the care leading sometimes to even ECMO uh, or whatever available um, devices. ECMO is more readily available. I remember back in the days, uh, even at the VA, Dr. Hilguden, we started doing ECMO on the cath lab table. And, and in Lebanon, things are much, much, much different. We have one ECMO machine. Uh, in our hospital and the biggest center in Lebanon has two and can get one more as a loaner. So ECMO is not readily available in, 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 in countries such as Lebanon. So uh, I, 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 I will, this is an, like I mentioned myocarditis because there's the hype coming with it later on when we talk about athletes. Last but not least, acute coronary syndrome. The last thing that can go wrong with that pump is the plumbing of the pump. And while there are two things that we talk about usually in, 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 when it comes to acute coronary syndrome, there is definitely the usual plaque rupture process, but there is definitely a recognized and described uh, uh, process of, of prothrombotic pro process and basically MIs happening because of and fulminant ST elevation MIs happening and you take them to the calf and you discover it's all about endothelial dysfunction. And really that is your typical plaque rupture. And sometimes you have patent coronaries. So this is something that we, uh, we, we are seeing, we are trying uh, to understand with time and clearly um, uh, more on this will be uh, coming in the near future. Now, three quick slides uh, on, three or four quick slides on the routine 
cardiac non-invasive imaging. Because I remember from my days on the Hellerstein or NAF or, or any of the services, it's, you know, have a patient that, 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 that has, before even hypoxia, you go and get a TTE. You know, just before we examine them, we used to order the TTE. Uh, and and uh, this in the era of COVID was a bit problematic initially. I know now that we're fully equipped with PPEs and we can do them uh, in a safe environment. Sometimes you don't have the luxury. In my center, we have two technicians for echo. If we lose one of them, the second will be on call for, for forever. So it was important when it comes to non-invasive imaging to start using the, uh, the resources properly. We shouldn't be performing routine cardiac imaging with patients that, that, uh, that have COVID. And we should only do it if it changes the management. Now, even when we do it, we should keep our protocols as short as possible. I know we want a full protocol for accreditation, but sometimes you should go and know what you're looking for. If you're looking for myocarditis, if you're looking for the cardiomyopathy, you go search for it. If you're looking for an effusion, a rare finding, but if you're looking for a pericardial effusion, you go focused and you get it. And a lot of times you can always go back and do the full echo and the full assessment uh, later on. So to address this, the American Society of Echocardiography actually uh, issued a statement and recommendations. And I will, I will not go over this algorithm. It's published, it's readily available for everyone, but we should always think about it when we're looking for the cardiac manifestation, we should exam, examine, think about it and go support ourselves with, with the imaging rather than get the imaging before, before knowing what we're looking at. Similar with the European Society of Cardiology, also issuing recommendation about not just who needs to get an echo, but what we should wear when we're getting an echo again, and mostly to preserve the, the house staff getting these. How about TEEs? Also, I'd be interested to know what, what's been done uh, in Cleveland, but in our center, uh, we are requesting, uh, even for outpatient TEEs, now that we're back a bit on, we're not anymore just on emergency basis, uh, we're, we're back on semi-normal uh, schedule. Uh, we are requesting PCRs before the TEE within, within 48 hours of, of, of the procedure because we know that the TEE carries an increased risk of spreading COVID-19, uh, especially, you know, we're, we're intubating with the, with, the, with the probe. And in some instances, if we really need to, to rule out a left appendageal clot or thrombus, doing a CTE might be more, more reasonable, especially that, again, the CT is set to receive somehow COVID patient. That's what they're doing around the clock, uh, right? They're checking CT non-contrast for these lungs to see how much involvement and how bad is the lung involvement. So I wanted to mention this uh, in, in my presentation just because I think initially, at least what we witnessed here in our center, initially a patient comes in, hypoxic, called cardiology to get a TTE. And the hypoxia, when, when, it's, when we knew and we have a CT scan telling us the hypoxia is part of this process, it doesn't have to be heart failure. And sometimes from the scan, you can get super basic information, you know, on LV, RV size. And that's why when you're ordering these, uh, just probably think twice about the question. I have to be somehow complete in my presentation, but I really don't want to open this, this really, this, this big discussion on the STEMI and the non-STEMI, because as you saw, and as you probably, uh, you saw it in, in Europe, in, in Italy initially, there was a, you know, big change in practice at some point in some countries with STEMI, moving, shifting from primary PCI to lytics. And Later on, when things became a bit more under control, things went back to normal. I have to say that I will not again go about, about you know, like uh, this specific image uh, or, or, or protocol, but 
what, what we noticed is that resources once again play a major role. If you have two cath labs, a lot of centers dedicated one cath lab to COVID patients and one kept it to non-COVID. In our center, we have one cath lab and that cath lab has to be has to be the only cath lab we can use. While this I mean, can, can be problematic, we, we, we did not use TPA except on one patient in the, entire, in the entire pandemic, especially in the worst days of the pandemic. So in some places, you know, they had moved completely to fibrinolysis. I'm mentioning this, this, I want to mention it because all these are related to cardiology. And I'm sure in the discussion, it will be asked, there was the STEMI issue that became initially through, but had caused a lot of discussion in the community about what are we going backward by doing TPA? And there was the issue of hypertense of, of the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocker. And again, I don't want to, to go into the details of that. It was clear issued by the American, uh, 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 by ACC, American College of Cardiology and the HHA that, you know, people can continue their treatment for the antihypertensive. Now, last two or three slides on the cardiac manifestations of COVID, I named my slide, not sure where these cardiac manifestations will fit, because we spoke about the direct effect of COVID, direct or indirect on the heart, on the pump. But there are the things that come with it. There are truly cardiac manifestations, but they're not measured the same way. Among them was, you know, this thing, you know, the reduced rate, and you've all heard about less people coming with acute coronary syndrome during the COVID-19. And this was published and recognized, whether in New York or in Italy. This could have been explained by several reasons, right? People sitting at home, confined, not having the same triggers potentially uh, to have their acute coronary syndrome but also people calling sometimes 911 when it's too late and dying at home. Actually, I, uh, I, I did not want to go, this is medical grand round and a cardiology grand round I gave earlier in, in my institution. I showed the case of a patient who, who kept infarcting all afternoon. Uh, this was April of, of last year, closed LAD completely closed, came to us literally with like an EF of five to 10%. Luckily, he made it, you know, went into cardiogenic shock, the whole thing. And then luckily he made it, got, got discharged, did fine, uh, put on entresto after like, you know, st stabilization, after finishing his cardiogenic shock, as you know, like entresto hasn't been proven for immediately post-shock, but ultimately we optimized him initially, beta blocker, full dose, got an ICD, Unfortunately, in the outbreak, in the second big wave that happened after Christmas this year, got COVID and ended up dying. It's, what, it's a sad story, obviously. The guy was elderly. But I think this is among the, you know, now it's counted ultimately as a COVID death when he died from COVID. But the STEMI that happened and the cardiomyopathy that happened and this predisposition to dying from COVID, I don't know how it, 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 is, it will be ever uh, uh, really measured. Because this guy was clear, I had echoes on him from the 5-10% to almost 25%. Anterior wall, wall was dead, but 25% comes with COVID and comes again to, the, to, to a shivering heart and nothing uh, we could do could save him. He was not a candidate for dialysis and ended up with, uh, with uh, renal failure, multi-system organ damage. So these are things that are truly cardiac manifestations that are affecting the heart, related directly or indirectly to COVID that we can't measure. Similar to this is this big thing of the heart failure therapy. You know, heart failure is our biggest problem. This was a nice article. I invite the people interested in heart failure that was published again very recently in uh, the ESC Heart Failure Journal but it's talking about the inside of the heart failure hospitalization management and services during and beyond COVID, okay? This is not a manifestation, but this is really how the, the way we're delivering care to heart failure patients is changing. By doing more remote, we were just chatting with Dr. Josephson and I before starting about how, you know, these EMRs stepped into, into the, the, the COVID business by, by pushing more, you know, uh, e-visits and all that. 
but specifically in the heart failure population where it's key to monitor parameters, I think we will be seeing, you know, historically, I remember the Heller's gene, it used to, uh, to, to, to have a name the, when we discharge patient uh, on, on this specific home care, have to be seen within a certain amount of days for their heart failure, and we would send a nurse all this change, all this exposure that might be deemed unnecessary, the physical exposure, but we still need, we still need to prevent readmission from heart failure. We still need to follow on them. So I think this is a very interesting need. And this is another cardiac manifestation or a cardiac change uh, COVID could, could have that we still need to, 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 to worry. And the last thing, I really don't know how to measure, but I'm seeing, you know, this is a, I, <laughs> I, I took just a screenshot. The yellow line is the start of the month, which is March. These are my last patients I saw in clinic, in my outpatient clinic. The reason for, for presentation. So, so again, I just put them together. And really, I can't, I can't uh, tell you. And you can just see here, again, I'm a cardiologist in Lebanon. So cardiologists will treat hypertension here, will treat dyslipidemia. But see, I, hypertension used to be my, my bread and butter, my biggest money maker in my outpatient clinic. But see how many. Post-COVID cardiac evaluation, post-COVID palpitations, SVT post-COVID exposure. This is a, one of the practical nurses on the floor who, who knew that she was exposed to a COVID patient and had an SVT, true SVT, the first time of her life, but it was AVNRT. That was triggered by that shock. And post-COVID chest pain. These are people that, you know, I, I usually choose what to order for each one of them. But there is a post-COVID syndrome. And this is a cardiac manifestation, still a cardiac manifestation. These people coming, and I swear they will tell you, we're hurting here. And they will point with their finger, not one, not twice. This is really, I took a sample of 20 patients. You know, yes, there is the PFO, a typical chest pain, syncope. But look how many people coming post-COVID. These will not be in any of the statistics I showed earlier. These will not be in, in cardiomyopathy because they don't have it, or in arrhythmia because they don't have it, or in ACS because they don't have it. These are people who just have something happen post-COVID. Uh, this chest pain that can last, this feeling not good that can last a bit longer than the two weeks or the 10 days uh, after the positive PCR. And some of them, four to, I'm, I'm just giving them time. When I see that the symptoms are bad and we're still close to the disease, I'm checking just a CRP, D-dimer, uh, CPK, troponin, just to have a sense and having usually an echo and an EKG to have a sense if there is an effect on the heart and if that inflammatory process is going. Now, Competitive sports, why an interventional cardiologist will deal with competitive sports? Well, it's pretty simple. Next to my clinic, just literally next door, behind this wall, is the most famous knee surgeon in Lebanon. He's the knee surgeon, he's the ACLs or what have you. He's the, the surgeon related to, to, uh, to, to all national teams. And that's unfortunately how it is. So he approached me and said that the International Federation of Basketball required for every patient, every basketball player, professional basketball player that had COVID to be screened by a cardiologist before resuming competitive sport. Now, again, maybe at case you have, you have a team dedicated to that. Uh, here, <laughs> the, 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 we're three in the group, my boss, who's 61 and who is a CMO, so busy with administration. Another colleague who's, who's, uh, who's, uh, uh, who's 65 and who, who, who didn't want to deal with anything related to COVID. And so it fell automatically on me. And it's interesting because it's a good learning experience. So this is our Lebanese national team in the last participation in, in, in the qualification for the Asian Championship. And out of these players, I had five coming to my office. I had to screen five of them because remember, this is the population that gets COVID. They go, they party, they're in their 20s when they're not training and professionally playing. And of course, the season was not started because of COVID. So I learned a lot about the cardiac assessment of uh, first when, 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 when the, I was told I need to screen the national team. I went and I had just read that article because it created a lot on Medscape and a lot of noise on Medscape that, 
you know, doing cardiac MRI on patients who had recovered from COVID, comparing two groups and talking that up to uh, really there is CMR revealed cardiac involvement in 78, 78% and in, of patient and inflammation in 60%. This for me, this is the only thing I knew when I was asked. So then I went to the literature to see what's being done. And really, I mean, I found that later on, people reported that really it's not as high as that was described in that paper. And this was the JAMA cardiology published in January 2021. I had to see the national team just a few weeks ago because they had to participate internationally last week. And you can see from this paper, and I just chose a few points just to elicit maybe a discussion that really myocarditis was really, really low in occurrence, 1.4%. And really cardiac MR as a screening tool is not as, as, as established and probably should not be done. It's definitely, it definitely cannot be done where I work because we don't do cardiac MR. I have to send them to a different center. Uh, so what I did for the athletes, and I'll tell you toward the end, but I read, luckily, the, the, the sports group from the American College of Cardiology. I'm pretty sure Dr. Josephson uh, will, uh, might know more about this, but they had issued you know, some statements. And there are several groups throughout the world that are talking about what needs to be done. COVID and athletes is a big thing. I will not talk about the isolation, the bubble they had to be in when they play. I'm just talking about cardiac manifestation of COVID. How can I clear my, my, my five players coming to see me to go and participate and what should I do for them? So there was a lot of thoughts for the sake of time, just to keep time for discussion, I, I will, I will uh, skip them. And there is still ongoing registries happening in the world, being collected to talk about the, uh, you know, what happens. What I did is very simple. This is a sample of my note. I, is, I, I identify for every one of them, when did they get their COVID? How close are they from being cured? Timeline of the infection. I check their symptoms to see, are they in this asymptomatic COVID? Do they have mild, did they have mild COVID, moderate or severe COVID? And for most of them, for all of them, I actually did an echo and an EKG. Do I have strong data to back myself? No, I don't. Uh, but short of doing an MRI, these are professional athletes. You know, I did, uh, I did GLS for all of them, global longitudinal strain like we do for uh, for patients uh, going for chemotherapy. And you can see in my, in my assessment plan on the right lower corner, what I said, you know, I, 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 in, in some of, I just didn't mention, I had actually one international referee, international referee. So she, as a referee, also they had to go <laughs> to the screening, not just the players, but, but the referees also. So I had, because she was closer to the disease and was still having symptoms, I went with my D-dimer, uh, you know, troponin, CPK, CRP, just inflammatory markers, uh, uh, ferritin also, just to see where I am in the disease process. Do I have data on this? It's double zeros. It's just some recommendation by some groups and feeling better checking that there are no EKG changes and uh, related to, to COVID injury and that the EF is normal. Last, and again, I want to open to keep time for discussion. We're doing a super small study for us. <laughs> it's the biggest we can do because it doesn't need much resources. But because there was a lot of talks on the endothelial involvement of COVID, what we did is very simple. We have this UMC medic management of endothelial dysfunction in COVID, and we're randomizing patients to a combination of medications with theoretical benefit on the endothelium, you know, L-arginine, nebivalol, atorvastatin, folic acid, nicorandil. So this is really small, 80 patients. We enrolled 20 so far, inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria. I mean, nothing really fancy in this. And we're really looking at simple outcomes. Do how much time they need to improve or no, did they die? The hospital admission, did they need to, be, you know, the, these are patients coming to the emergency department. So patients coming to the emergency department with COVID. So then these are not the asymptomatic one or the mild uh, forms of COVID. So uh, we're collecting all these parameters. If they are 
requ requiring ventilation, admission, oxygen, no oxygen, and a secondary outcome, we're collecting the troponin, the D-dimer, the oxygen requirement, all the things I mentioned. With this, I want to thank you, uh, thank Dr. Armitage for the invitation, and thank every uh, uh, person that, that really uh, had the chance to talk to uh, earlier, because uh, you, uh, this is my class, by the way, cl uh, the, the class, my class in residency, and uh, as I said, I'm, I'm forever grateful for all the people, mm. especially the, the great educators, that uh, that were part of uh, of uh, getting me where I am. So with this, I want to thank you all uh, for listening. This is our center, by the way. This is the medical school, which is outside of Beirut in Biblos, and this is our center uh, currently where where I practice. With, I'm happy to take any question. You can write them on the chat. Uh, again, I tried. I tried in this. Uh, you can write them here. Where I said you're high. But I try to talk a bit on cardiac manifestations in general. Uh, this, every one of these can be a topic by itself, but it was good to have a global overview on how COVID can affect the heart and a bit of a twist on the athlete specific situation of athletes return, return to training. And, uh, and with this, I'm happy to take questions. I, think, I don't think I have more slides. I had one funny slide at the end. Because this, 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 this guy I miss. I don't know who. Uh, <laughs> this, this guy specifically, the the new Channel Five. Uh, whether uh, I'm a big fan of this guy. So, so just if if one of you uh, uh, sees him, tell him, send him that he has fans in Beirut. <laughs> Neil, that was awesome. And uh, uh, you know, people that don't know you can just tell what you know. You were just such a great contributor when you're here. Not only medically, but just to, to the civilized culture that we try to have in the Department of Medicine, the Residency and Cardiology Fellowship. You're here for eight years? I, eight, yeah. I eight moved in 2009. Research. I yeah. did two years uh, next to Joanna Benson in the core lab. And then, and then I did three of medicine, three of cardiology. And then after that, Brown, then, then mm -hmm. Mass General. So 10 years yeah. in the U.S. Yes. So, I, you know, I start out by asking you a question. Um, you know, I saw a patient last week who has, you know, what's what we call long haul COVID, post COVID. You know, uh, Anthony Fauci came out this weekend and say it's now it's now um, post acute COVID syndrome, PASC. And she was a young nurse, you know, pretty healthy, who had pretty severe autonomic dysfunction, you know, POTS, dysautonomia. And actually, I didn't post about this particular patient, but I I posted something about this and heard from a lot of cardiologists who are seeing a lot of this autonomic dysfunction. This patient has, you know, sinus tag at baseline after her COVID. She has, um, she has pretty bad orthostasis after her COVID. So only this sort of pot syndrome. And I think, I think, unfortunately, we're going to see that more and more. I don't know if that's something you're seeing now. I have no idea what the mechanism is. Yeah, uh, I, I can, I, I don't have any clue about the mechanism. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear like input from, from uh, smarter people in the group here, but definitely, definitely sinus tachycardia, tachycardia as a prevalent problem when people are doing okay, you know, and you know, a lot of times, you know, they're done with their COVID. They, they come to you, they put that still have the pulse oximeter, they put it and they come to you with a, with a heart rate of 100 teens, 120s, yeah. at rest and it's challenging because a lot of times it triggers sometimes an automatic reflex of imaging sometimes going even to ctpe protocols on people who are not hypoxic because of just the tachycardia i i what i'm doing in general as i said is checking where are we in that inflammatory just assessing objectively that where are we in that inflammatory yeah. process when i see the tachycardia if i see the crp still not completely normalized. Your patient probably is, 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 I mean, had normalized all the markers. I'm giving time and I'm telling these people, I'm setting expectations. Whenever it, I had to put one patient on a beta blocker, honestly, because it, it was one, mid 120s. And, and sometimes, you know, you start thinking, doubting your EKG skills. Can it be an ATAC or something else? Because we know the magic number, the 120, the 110 ventricular rate of 110 leading to tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So 
so for me, I'm just giving time. I'm objectively checking, and I'll be interested in knowing, you know, from the cardiologist with us what what what's been done. Sure. You know, also my patient has seen a cardiologist and put on a beta blocker. Um, a lot of comments, a lot of nice nice comments um, uh, in the chat. Um, and, and Dr. Chandra asked about COVID-related pericardial disease. Again, if anybody else is participating, has any other comments or from cardiology, please jump in. Uh, so, actually, this is Rana Hijal, not cardiologist. Emil, it's so such an honor to see you back home. Um, it, it's great to see you. You've done a great job here, and I'm sure you're going to do it over there. The, the post-COVID uh, syndrome that Keith is talking about is yet to be defined, but there's a lot of reports, not only in heart problems, but also in lung problems. I think in the ICU, we missed a lot of heart disease because we were always focusing on how bad the hypoxia is and how bad the lung disease are. At UH here, there is going to be a uh, post-COVID uh, clinic that's in, in uh, in preparation, basically, and it's going to be a multidisciplinary clinic that will involve uh, pulmonary medicine, ID, cardiology, physical medicine, like every single thing that you can think about. Um, but my question to you, and at least in your study with the athletes, is uh, you're getting their data at rest. Why do you think? Why can you get their data during exercise? Yeah. Yeah, so so it it's uh, it, it's a great question. I've 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 put one of them on on. Uh, I've had them coming in two instances. You know, in Lebanon we had two two peaks of the disease, and in general, the one that are coming that most of the one coming to me had the COVID around Christmas and had already resumed exercising because they didn't care about seeing a cardiologist going by FIBA. The National League is stopped. They only had to knew about it when they, they came to me because they had to travel to Bahrain to, to participate and represent the country. So in, in one specific, you know that we don't like to, to stress them immediately in the, in the, in, in the post-COVID, immediately when there's still the inflammation is still going on. It's not recommended and they go progressively uh, with resuming exercise. I had to resume one, to, to stress one, after I did the blood test, to do a stress test on one, because he was still having these post-COVID, uh, you know, symptoms and still this uh, subjective feeling of dyspnea. And, and again, I, because most of them had resumed training twice per day, I found it just, I wanted a documentation that their heart, and I, I'm basing myself on, on, on what's available. Maybe ideally I would have gotten a cardiac MR, but that's what I, what I had. I, I want to, just address two also points mentioned by Dr. Chandra, one, pericardial disease and COVID. Uh, I haven't seen a lot, honestly, of pericardial, you know, we, we see, peri you know, like when they come, that ST elevation usually is taking them to the lab. I haven't seen the typical pericarditis more type of thing where the typical PR depression ST elevation, the one that have ST elevation are the one that and I took two to the lab with ST elevation with, with normal coronaries, normal meaning patent to coronaries. And I'm pretty sure you, you had much more at case. Um, now, Dr. Josephson mentioned on something that that's, yeah, maybe from a philosophical perspective, I think it was quite challenging because I, you know, when you train and sub, 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 sub specialize, you only have to be in a situation to go back. And, and, and uh, this year for me, I was an infectious disease primary care physician. And I say it, and I say it, uh, um, if you tell me, the guys know how biased I am to OCT, fancy intravascular imaging, that's what I proctor, that's what I do. I did one OCT last year, one. Because of the economic crash, it's not co covered by the insurers, no one could afford it. <laughs> and two, we were going on emergency basis. So what I do is I ended up going back, reading the protocols, and I don't, Want, uh, and for because they wanted me to comment on the trainees, how life is about continued lifelong learning. I think in every institution, there are smart people that sit and put protocols. I, I don't claim I'm, I'm smarter than, than any of my colleagues here. All I did was just going to the protocols and taking two or three of them, reading them and looking at the data behind them and, and, and being systematic because especially when I... It's, I didn't choose to take care of more than 130 patients in my village. You know, my like municipality, which is like the local governments, assigned me because we had four physicians in my village, a village of 3,000 people, which is a 
the, the big problem, by the way, we are a ski resort area in Lebanon. So being a ski resort, we had a major outbreak on New Year. Everyone went there. No one, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people, the restaurants are still open. A Christmas, New Year, major outbreak. We had four deaths in my village. That's a huge number to have four deaths in a small village. But I was assigned because we have two surgeons and ophthalmologists and, and, and de facto, you find yourself, again, am I the best person to, to treat this? And all I did was going to the smart people, the virologist we have here who is superb, uh, and, and took his protocol, applied it, and tried to even organize a basic response team, which, again, I would never have imagined myself two years earlier being a super specialized fellow doing below the knee critical limb ischemia and, and, and uh, intravascular imaging doing that. What we did actually imagine, we did fundraising to get basic needs and medication stored in, and, and a group of, of people like the EMS. We had people, three people trained to EMS to deliver oxygen. And that's what made the difference when the hospital when the hospital were fully saturated after New Year. We had the post New Year when people were not finding places. We bought seven machines for oxygen. You know, I became an expert in oxygen. Can you imagine like as a cardiologist reading about oxygen generators, the one that can give three to five liters. And I had put people on oxygen. I put people on steroids at home. I started Eliquis, you know. It's sometimes the situation that makes you do it. It's not that you choose it, so. Yeah. That's fantastic. Probably have time for one more question. Um, it, it is one o'clock. Um, I can't thank you enough. I say, um, shukran nikir kabir. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's no, it's, and, I, I should be the one thanking you. I told oh, you before. And, uh, I'm forever no, grateful. So you're just uh, you're you're greatly missed, and it's fantastic to see you. And your your fan club turned out in droves. We hit <laughs> over uh, we hit over a hundred in the Zoom. Which is pretty high for uh, for grand rounds, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and 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 what you've done is so wonderful, and and I do think you're you know you I, I hope you're, you're broad based in trauma medicine your time in the carpenter team you know, paid <laughs> off during the pandemic so uh, absolutely absolutely thank you so much Emil it's, it's my it was, pleasure uh, my pleasure have a great day and thanks and as I said I'm forever grateful and for the residents you're 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 lucky I've been in <laughs> in four institutions and you are in the best place you can train for so. Bye, guys. Bye. Emil, Emil, fantastic. Emil, great, great to see you. Terrific talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.